Did you do any hunting? And at yes, all? I, I, uh, I, I had Gene Van Gilder, my predecessor, had been, uh, from all accounts, a great outdoorsman. And he was an excellent horseman and uh, had uh, 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 participated to a great extent in the hunting and fishing end of it. I, I was more of a, of course, I was off the city streets. I was not the outdoor type as such. Uh, but I did love to, to do those things. And so that fall, I, uh, with the help of uh, Taylor Williams, who was the head guy, known finally as Bear Tracks, uh, he took us down to uh, hunt ducks down in the south of Sun Valley. And I went out hunting with uh, Hemingway and uh, Lloyd and Chape and uh, whoever else was around and to uh, hunt for pheasants. Hemingway used to go, with my recollection of uh, many recollections of him, he was always, I was always impressed by the courtesy with which he stopped at a farmhouse and asked permission to hunt pheasants before he did it. And then if they didn't, if they said no and didn't care who he was or anything like that, they, he would ask at another farmhouse. And uh, it was only when we got permission that would we, would we go and hunt. And uh, then a few days later, after the hunt, he would go back there with his arm full of groceries and a turkey or two or something like that and stay for dinner with the people and uh, have a real ball. Uh, parenthetically, he had uh, been, as uh, for most of his life, a great affinity for the bottle, and uh, he referred to Scotch whiskey as any Lowry juice. <laughs> yeah. And uh, later on, I think the following year, I went uh, on an extended one of the out for the the big game department. In those days, you could uh, uh, go over to uh, nearby Warm Springs, which is maybe, let's say, two miles from Sun Valley Lodge, and come here and catch them and, and get them. In fact, the state championship here in 1940 was shot by an assistant chef over in the Warm Springs Canyon, the largest uh, antler head in the state. No condominiums in those days, just, uh, yes. just wildlife. And I went on... Uh, one hunting expedition, the most memorable one with uh, Hemingway uh, and Taylor Williams up to the place called the Shinwai Valley. And uh, I had, uh, it was a great adventure. Uh, I never called Hemingway Papa at that time, that came later. But he and Taylor and I went out. And Taylor was a wonderful guide and, a, and, a, and an unbelievably fine cook. He had one failure the guy. He would shoot first. That was normally a guide says the people are paying. But, points in the game and let them do the shooting. So uh, Hemingway spotted an antelope that had a distorted or deformed head. The horns looked like curly, like a corkscrew size on each side. And it was really weird looking back. Like. And he showed me the glasses. And he said, let's get Taylor to tell him it's a big deal. It's a great, great beautiful thought and let him have the first shot. So he always does that. So, so we and we looked through the glasses, and I made the proper explanations of what a beautiful head it was. And Taylor was like a honey boy with about his tail up and his like poor bent. And uh, so he raised his rifle as fast as he could and fired at this thing because that was his antelope. That's all he could get, one antelope. So we had a big ha ha ha, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs>
then he became very, very uh, amiable and uh, friendly. In fact, once or twice he asked me to go down and shoot rabbits with him. I didn't enjoy that very much because this was in Burley and the farmers were driving the rabbits got too many and to shoot them down and well Ernest was essentially he was a good hunter but he didn't mind killing you know just well in a way he helped the farmers but to me I didn't enjoy that particularly but he was one heck of a shot I can tell you that and uh, especially in the fall when he and Cooper came the ducks that these two guys killed was unbelievable. They would bring him up and hang him up on a 12-foot cabin when there was first a little cabin there. They hang him up on all the rafters and age him there for two weeks. <laughs> Decoration at a 12-foot cabin by, <laughs> by a Cooper and Hemingway. <laughs> I never went alone. I don't think it's wise to go alone. Hunting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what got you interested in hunting? Well, Papa. Okay. When you came here to Idaho, your interest well, began. Well, um, he wasn't here until, see, we, were, we built the house in 49 and then moved in. And he wasn't here. If he had been here, I didn't know him then. but. One time, at some time, they threw a big party out of Trail Creek, mm -hmm. and it was really fun. And everybody we knew were there was there. And of course, Wynn had already met him because he was up with Bud Purdy, uh -huh. and so we were invited. I was thrilled. <laughs> and, well, I came from Illinois, where he was born. Papa was born, mm -hmm. and he used to go up to. Uh, Michigan, not Upper Michigan, but around Little Traverse Bay. Well, I spent my entire childhood there, every oh. every summer. So I was familiar with every inch of what he was describing in those Nick Adams stories, if okay. you're familiar with them. No, no. Oh, you should read them. I, I, lo I don't know, I must reread them. <laughs> but, um, so we were standing at the bar getting a drink, and I thought, well, you've got to get your courage up sooner or later and say something. You can't stand there like a dummy. Mm -hmm. So I said, I've been reading your books, and I'm terribly interested in the ones about uh, Petoskey and Harbor Springs. Um, I was, I've been there. It's, it's just home to another home. I even uh -huh. took Peter and Jed there oh. because it's such a beautiful place. Uh -huh. And I, of course, was more in the resort thing, and he was more in the country kind of thing. But all those stories are places that one could recognize. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, for a shy person, I seem to be talking a lot. And he said, well, I'm enjoying it. You know, it's really uh -huh. dear. Uh -huh. He was awfully nice to me. And he said, are you, do you hunt? That was it. He said, do you hunt? And I said, oh, I've always wanted to. And he said, get a license. Huh. And that was the beginning of this whole, you know, then we went hunting all the time. Uh -huh. First with a um, 22 and shot rabbits mm -hmm. to get used to the gun. Mm -hmm. And then with a shotgun, and it was Wynn's father's, and it gave me a black cheek. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> never fit. Uh -huh. And we shot uh, rabbits again. And that, that, you know, then you learn to be safe with the gun as you're walking over tough terrain. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Which it, is terribly important. Who was with you on your first rabbit shoot? Papa and Mary and Wynn and I. Uh huh. It seems like uh, Mr. Hemingway didn't mind women being good at those kinds of things, like hunting. Fishing. He liked it. Yeah. He was he was just as proud of you as he could be. Uh -huh. With my first duck, 
we were all down at Bud Purdy's, and that time the, the group was much larger. Mm. And um, uh, we were walking up toward a, a, a little irrigation canal, and I, of course, was in fear and trembling as to I do the right thing and stuff. And so all of a sudden the ducks go up, and it's, of course, that breathtaking moment when the sky is full of birds, and it's so exciting. Yeah. And so we all shot, and Papa got a double, oh. and I'm not sure he didn't get a triple, but he said, he came over and he brought me this big mallard, and he said, this is yours, this is the one you shot. Well, I was, I was absolutely thrilled to pieces. <laughs> I've never known whether he really shot uh -huh. it or whether I did, uh -huh. but it was, you know, I was making the effort anyway, so. You know, exactly. there, there are so many Hemingway books, and they never talk about Hemingway the way he was, as far as I'm concerned. It couldn't mm -hmm. have been nicer to me and, mm -hmm. and to Wynn and all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, he was really a deer. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's your he was not to... drinking all the time, okay. and he, you know... I'm yeah. Well, this is, you know, your forum, and so if you've read something that you'd like to take exception to and get it on record, now's the time to do it, because it's time to set the record straight. I know Don Anderson has told me the same thing, mm -hmm. and others yeah, have Yeah, Don too. was part of the group, and, yeah. and uh, you know, we, we had such good times, and Papa never took a drink when he had a gun in his hand. Hmm. And I thought that was a very good object lesson. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in... Mm -hmm. combining the two either. Mm -hmm. And the people who talk about his, his reeling around, he never did reel. And I saw him under many conditions, mm -hmm. you know, both at parties and, and uh, um, privately, because we used to walk. Now that, I must admit, when we before we'd go walking sometimes, I would join him in the Duchin room, uh, and I was sort of horrified at myself because I'm not a drinker. And I'd have a glass of Teal Pepe, that's a very dry sherry, mm. and he would have a drink. Mm. And then we would go out and walk, because he was hipped on the walking thing. And oh. I think Mary had a broken arm at that time, so mm -hmm. she didn't go. And we'd walk all the way up to Proctor Mountain on the what's now the Fairways Road. Uh -huh. That was just a trail then. Uh -huh. Sometimes with Jed and the dog, usually mm -hmm. always with the dog. We mm -hmm. had a wonderful dog named Flag. Mm. He had a tail that looked like a flag. Yeah, yeah. Hmm, okay. Well, that's good but to I hear. But uh, just, you know, the, the picture that they give him was a, as, and as being arrogant. He wasn't arrogant. He, I don't think he ever spoke putting down a servant down, for example, which many people have done. Mm -hmm. Some of the movie star people, mm -hmm. the Johnny Come Latelys, as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned, on the social scene did do that to the help, and we'd hear about it, of course, because we all knew the help so well. Right, right. Hmm. So he, Funny. from what you experienced, he was pretty kind to his friends. And Absolutely. And, uh, Very fond of all of our group, uh -huh. you know, and we were about 10. Mm -hmm. The only time I saw him really get mad ooh, was we were hunting down at the Cove Ranch, and there was a, we were hunting chuckers, uh -huh. partridge, and there's a canal that goes along there. I think it's still there. So I was up high, and he was down low, and Mary was there, of course, and Pat and George Saviors, but everybody was spaced out, you know. Mm -hmm. So we were walking, he, and Papa is going like this, and then like this, here we go, oh. onward, you know. Right. Just great. <laughs> it was fun. And um, um, we, <laughs> we started going forward, and there was a little puddle sort of there, and two ducks flew up. And Pat turned around and shot at the ducks and didn't hit them. If she had hit them, it might have been better. He was so mad. He said, when you go for one kind of game, you do not shoot another and ruin the... Because that made the chuckers go right up the hill. Right. And they do that. They, they go right up the side of the hill and you can't get them. Laugh at you when mm -hmm. you're up there. Or don't they? They <laughs> chuckle. Yeah, yes, right. they do. <laughs> yeah. So he kind of had some... Solid ideas about hunting, didn't he? Oh, very solid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was yeah, full of good. lore. One time we were down at Silver Creek at the, because it was Wynn's Ranch, you mm -hmm. know, and I was walking with him and Wynn was walking with Mary, and we came to a place where there were some bobcat tracks, 
And he said, now I'm going to give you a little nature lesson. And so I was, you know. <laughs> All ears. <laughs> yeah. And so um, he showed me where the bobcat had a baby, smaller cub, oh. you know, tracks. And there were also tracks from his having killed a bird, some kind of a big bird. Mm -hmm. I know maybe a sage hen, or maybe mm -hmm. a pheasant. In the old days, there were a few. And then he taught the, all from these tracks, he taught the cub, this, this must have been a she, bobcat, taught the cub how to kill a bird. Oh. And all of this was out in the snow. And he could read it all. Yes, he yeah. could read it all. Isn't that something? You know, mm -hmm. it's it's wonderful to learn natural things like right. that. Right, right on the spot. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it was a beautiful setting. I can still yeah. see it in my mind's eye, you know. Yeah. Did he tell any other stories to you that are memorable oh, all the like time. that? All the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about being up in Michigan, mm -hmm. but because, of course, we both knew the area yeah. so well. Yeah. So you had that unique connection. I yeah, mean, immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I never, heavens, I was never in Oak Park. I wouldn't have known anything like that. He, he did not like his mother. How, how did he feel about his sister? <laughs> Sunny is her name? I don't know. I think she's still up there. I don't think they were so friendly. Is he, so his nuclear family wasn't very His close. family was all of us, mm -hmm. really. So, Don yeah. Anderson and George Saviors. Mm -hmm and uh, Bud, and the, uh, what was their name? The ones who had the Cove Ranch, can't remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, not Bob Blakesley, but Mac. Mac, what's his name? And he may come up, you ought to get him to do a little history sort of thing. Was he close to the Goodings, uh, Hemingway? Not really, they were the different age. Mm -hmm. So he handed over on their property. But, oh, yeah. But mm -hmm. they weren't that close. I'm sure that they knew each other, because we all did. Yeah. But, um, and I'm sure they would be the first ones to lend their land for hunting. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Because he wasn't a game hog. There no. A lot of game hogs yeah. in the world. Yeah. He never was. Yeah. Limits were limits. Mm -hmm. And that's what one did. Mm -hmm. What was his outlook on hunting? I know that's been talked about too. Um, some people have said he was, he had a brutal outlook toward animals and some people felt that he had a very I, kind yeah, outlook. I think so. I think, I think he was appreciative of the way a duck flew, for example, mm -hmm. and he didn't mind killing it. Mm -hmm. And you don't when you're hunting. There's a certain sort of feeling that you get and not only that, and he certainly said it, and I thoroughly believe in it, and I've always said it with my children, anything you kill, you eat. Mm -hmm. The only thing he did was hang them outside in his garage until they were pretty creepy. Oh. And then they'd cook them, but oh. I didn't do it that way. <laughs> oh, gosh. But, I mean, you know, we were not wasting. Right. We were not wasteful hunters, ever. Uh -huh. Anything, all those things, we we all ate them. In the same way, I was trying to tell my kids was about the fish. Well, of course, they wouldn't eat the fish, so that was a natural to get them started on catch right. and release. Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Don Anderson's told me a lot about the, yeah. the beginnings of catch and release around mm -hmm. here. Hmm. Well, I've seen Hemingway in a picture with an owl that was found. Oh yes, and there looks, was an owl in yeah. the, when he uh, rented the Heist house. Oh, the, that's you know, what it was. Um, Marge Heist, uh -huh. the ninety-year-old lady mm -hmm. in town. Mm -hmm. Did you ever interview her? Uh, she has been interviewed. Is she? Yeah, Good. yeah, because she knows all about the western side, the cattle raising, and yeah. that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. But anyway, I never knew her husband. I guess he died before. But anyway, the Hemingways rented that house, and they had a owl. It was wounded, mm -hmm. and so they he. They were tending it back mm -hmm. to health, you know. Well, I, the look of the picture is a very is a very tender look mm -hmm. that he's having toward this owl. Oh, I I don't think that's what makes you so mad about some of these biographies is that they attribute things to that they they've gotten either from some the wrong kind of hearsay, right, or made up their minds about it. He right. was never a game hog. That's good to know. And yeah. was anathema about people who were. Uh -huh. I mean, he was really upset and. I have been upset equally about the people who shoot too damn many doves. 
That's why we don't have any anymore. Right. I remember when I think I first met him, and I think it was a, it was in the fall. Man, I was in grade school at the time at mm -hmm. Jacoby Square, and I was in the Ketchum Drugstore buying penny candy. It was my day to we all pooled our dimes and nickels, and we went out and you got the you know all the penny candy stuff that's yeah, the old yeah, fashioned yeah. stuff, you know. So my my route was the Golden Rule store, then across the street to the Ketchum Drug, which is now Windermere Realty or some some something. So I was in there doing that and he was buying a New York Times. And I said hello, or uh, he said hello, or we were looking at the magazine. I might have been looking for a crossword puzzle or something. But So anyway, he, he was buying the New York Times and we just said hello. And I, just, and I, I didn't know who he was, but I knew my parents knew him. Were you with your mom or no? Were you, no, so I was, I was on, on school break. Candy? I was on okay. recess at school. But you recognized him. But I, I'm not even sure. I, I don't really recall. Yeah. I don't know if I recognized him, or I think I did. I think I, I think he said, you know. I think he may have introduced himself. He yeah. may have known who I was because I think the by that kid. time yeah. he knew my parents. Yeah. There's so, there's so much. Um, you know, when you were describing that moment, which I think is really poignant, if you were buying the penny candy in the drugstore and you saw Hemingway and um, had an exchange, like, how, how did he look to you? Like, you know, he had a white beard. Yeah. He looked old. Mm -hmm. But he had merry eyes. Huh. Hmm. Is what I would call it. Mm-hmm. So I had a little twinkle. Mm -hmm. So you could see he was, I think he was a life enjoyer, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he liked life and all that. Mm -hmm. And that would be my take. And that's probably reflecting now, you know, 60 years later, right. um, on what, I, what my impression was then. Sure. So how mm -hmm. accurate it is, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Of course. And do you remember, I'll oh, go ahead. I just always say, as I said earlier, when you were with him and he was talking to you, you felt like you were the most important thing in his world at that moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, no kidding. And I, I would, I've said that for mm -hmm. 30 years when people have asked me. You know, here, you know, they came in the fall. Yeah. Okay, so they hunted stuff. But you know the hunting seasons close somewhere like in you know late December, right. and they were they stayed around for another few months. Yeah. And one of the things that they did is they would shoot rabbits, so they'd hunt rabbits, and they would take the rabbits and put them in uh, magpie traps. <laughs> so then the magpies would come in to eat the dead rabbits, and get trapped. You know there was a one way in, no way out kind of deal so they're big pens and then they would have live magpie shoots down at the Purdy's Gun Club on Silver Creek which exists to this day I like to be suburban but then they would, they would, they would close the day up in the Christie the Christiania uh -huh. Uh -huh. now known as Michelle's um, you would wind up there now you know 10 year old boys sitting at the bar in the Christiania probably weren't exactly legal, but nobody cared. It's not like I was drinking beer. So you literally did end up there. Like you would do Absolutely. this hunt and then you would go yes. to the bar at the Christian. <laughs> yeah, that's where you went after hunting. I mean, still is, you know, to some degree. And um, yeah, and then one night in there. And what would you talk about? Like, 
Well, you talk about the day. You, yeah. You, you talk, I mean, you talked about whatever you talked about in bars. You know, I mean, right? as a ten-year-old, were you were you mostly just listening or mostly? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was probably mostly just listening. But but the one the one thing about Mr. Hemingway is he would include you. So I was not just listening. You know, they yeah. would ask you for your opinion. Nice. Very often, mm -hmm. and and you would be comfortable enough to give it, and other things like that. And that was that was the case. And uh, yeah, um, I don't know. This sounds kind of self-serving, but you know, Mr. Hemingway actually at one of these things. Um, told me he would consider it to be an honor to allow him to buy me my first drink. This would probably mean legal drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> it was questionable in those days when legal actually was. <laughs> what that line was, the yeah. the slightest attention to, uh, to, you know, to the drinking age. As evidenced by a ten or eleven year old, whatever I was sitting <laughs> on a bar stool in a, you know, in a well, there's a bar restaurant, so it didn't right. really count. But but he said it would be a privilege to buy you your first drink. He did, drink. yeah. I was actually a little bit pissed when I heard that he killed himself. How could you forget that? <laughs> yeah, you could just see that. He owes you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, so what was, Wait, how did that, like, go through town? Like, do you remember hear, hearing about it? I mean, you were... It, were you away at school at that no, point? No, no, I was here. I yeah. was, it was in I the was, summer. Yeah. I believe at that point I could I, I could drive legal. I'd been driving for <laughs> Jesus five years probably, but so I, I think I was fourteen, just turned fourteen. So I either I had either just gotten my my official driver's license because my I was born June third, and I think it was early July when he killed himself. Yeah. But I, I, I think I remember, you know, Kasky used to be the radio station. It was based yeah. on the fourth floor of the lodge and in a room there. Bill Ennis was one of the disc jockeys, one of the founders. Of, he's dead now. He yeah. would have been a great guy to get an oral history from. Wow. Too bad mm -hmm. he didn't. But they lived across the lake from us. He was probably eight to ten years older than me. Mm -hmm. And we, we were good friends. Mm -hmm. Betty and I have traveled with him. Mm -hmm. We did travel with him many times. Um, but he was the disc jockey. So I think I had the radio on and was listening to it and heard about heard about it heard at it that point. Then. Wow. Yeah, then. Do you remember? I think I, I think I, I think I remember being in a car hearing about it on the radio. Yeah. Thinking, oh my God, my parents will just be heartbroken. Yeah. And did they talk about it much? Were they? How did they? Well, my father was a pallbearer at his funeral. Yeah. And um, they did not talk about it much. Mm -hmm. And they spent the next twenty years chasing people away that were trying to get them to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know. Meeting with Ernest Hemingway. Ginger, I don't know exactly what you call my first meeting with Ernest Hemingway because I knew him in telephone conversations a long time before I ever met him personally. Ernest and my husband, Fred Spiegel, were in Section 4 together during World War I, mm. and they kept up their friendship always uh, back at the suburbs of Chicago, from which the men in Section 4 all were drawn, 
<coughs> those of, the, of them who still lived there had reunions about oh, three, four times a year, including wives when there were any. Mm -hmm. And uh, although Ernest was never around when we had, they had these reunions, they always called him. Mm -hmm. And everyone would talk to him. And these conversations would be very interesting and a great deal of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, So in, these reunions would have been in the 20s? Yes. Mm -hmm. In 1928, in Paris, uh, he and Hadley were living there, and Freddie and I were visiting there, and uh, we had a date. I can't remember. I think it was before he was so famous. Mm -hmm. But I don't honestly remember in what year A Farewell to Arms was published. Mm. We could look that up. It's it, around there. It's but, around there, mm -hmm. but I don't remember. Anyway, uh, at that time, the telephones in Paris were not exactly what they, I hope they are today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we received what was called a petit bleu, or also called a pneumatique, <laughs> which was, there was, uh, in Paris there were tubes that ran all over. Do you remember in shops, we well, wouldn't remember, there were these tubes that went through the ceiling and somebody would put your money in a tube and press a button and it would go shooting into another place and then it would come back with your change in it. Well, it was a similar arrangement, but it was underground in Paris. Oh, it was, my. Uh, and it was a way of getting messages to people quicker than by mail when there was no telephone communication. Mm -hmm. So the afternoon, or around noon, of the day that we were going to have dinner together, we received a deep blur. But it was to cancel the date because Ernest was in the American hospital. What had happened was that uh, in their apartment, which was quite old-fashioned in its appliances, the uh, toilet was the sort that had a, uh, a box above it and a chain mm -hmm. to, to flush it. And what had happened was he also had a skylight in the bathroom that had a chain to open it. By mistake, Ernest pulled the chain on the skylight mm -hmm. instead of the one on the toilet, and all the skylight fell in on his head and cut it very badly mm -hmm. on the forehead. Mm -hmm. And he bore that scar all the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get to meet him that time. Mm -hmm. And Freddie went rushing off to the American hospital. I was not invited. <laughs> and, uh, by now he's somewhat mysterious to you, I think. Well, and by then it was one of those uh, things where on the telephone we refer to each other as the mythical Mrs. Spiegel and, <laughs> and the uh, strange Mr. Heavy, the evasive Mr. Heavy way. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think it was in 38, in the autumn out here, that we finally actually met. Mm -hmm. at, uh, at that time, he was not married to Marty Gilhorn, but it seems to be she was with him. I can't remember that exactly. And uh, it was exactly as if I was meeting an old friend again. There was nothing very new about talking to somebody that I'd talked to any numbers of times, although I'd never seen him in person. Now, between 28 and 38, he had been to Spain he in the had Lincoln Brigade. Oh, yes. He, w he went to Spain uh, for the Lincoln Brigade in 1936 or s late 36 or 7. Uh, I can't remember which. We were in Spain in 36, just before the Fronte Popular. And we left the, the day, two days before the elections. The uh, uh, embassy had, had put tickets in all the boxes of the Americans at their hotels. And uh, 
with a request to leave on the midnight for Paris. In fact, it, it, it was almost a command rather than a request. And we had driven up from Toledo that day. Well, this really has nothing to do with, with uh, the library. It's so, interesting, but we can move up to 1938 and... All right. To 1938, well, the, the, there you are. We met and immediately became friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we got along just beautifully, and uh, I became exceedingly fond of him. He was, in my opinion, a wonderful man. Uh, the, perfectly absurd things that have been written about him nauseate me mm -hmm. and anger me and I wish there were some way of of doing something about it. I'm not going to write a book about my friend mm -hmm. uh, but I am angered at the impertinence mm -hmm. of people who never met the man, never even saw him uh, assuming things about him. Mm -hmm. I remember once he said to me, we were reading a criticism of something he'd written, I don't know what it was, in which the critic had said, by such and such of Mr. Hemingway means, whatever it was, mm -hmm. and he said, God damn it, Clara, if I'm not a good enough writer to say what I mean, why do they bother to uh, write a criticism of what I've written? Mm -hmm. I said what I meant. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, the people who, who were here during the autumn were all people who knew each other. We didn't come to be with each other, mm -hmm. but we knew each other was going to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was great fun. You, usually at that time, the Coopers were here too. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, the shooting parties would consist of the family and uh, of people like Coop, uh, who came you know, every mm -hmm. year. And the, usually the parties at Trail Creek or each so at, at a house. For instance, a lot of them were at my house. No, they weren't at all. That was later. That was in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, How would you describe Gary Cooper? What was your impression of him? Oh, he was an absolute peach. Mm -hmm. He couldn't have been nicer in every way. He was a very modest, very unassuming, quiet man. He had a delightful smile and chuckle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think the thing that's the hardest for people to understand is, is that um, this was a group of friends. It, it wasn't a, a publicity stunt. Everything today seems to be somebody's a celebrity and they have to have this picture or that picture. Obviously, people who had Coop would pose for pictures, you know, would do things like that. That was part of his, his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ernest was very gracious about that. People were always coming up and asking if they could take a picture of him with his son or without his son or, you know, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And he always was most cooperative and pleasant with people, strangers, mm -hmm. even when they were delaying him and, and on occasion annoying him. Mm -hmm. If they became really annoying, for instance, in the Ram occasionally, some drunk would come up and uh, want to join the party. Mm -hmm. And we'll say that the party consisted of Ernest and his sons and, and maybe Lloyd and Tilly Arnold and me. And the, it wasn't a party. We were having dinner. We were tired. We'd been hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and some boor would want to, as I say, join the party. Ernest could be very, very brief, mm -hmm. always polite. He, he was able to turn someone like that away without being offensive. Mm -hmm. it, it was quite a talent, <laughs> I thought.
how would you characterize uh, him anyway? Well, my opinion of him is certainly lots different than other people. But I first uh, went out in the summer of 38. And I went fishing with him and took his boys fishing. And I took Jack Hemingway fishing when he was 16 years old. And I always said he's the best fisherman for 16 year old I ever met in my life. But anyway, uh, Hemingway was uh, a man's man. Tough, rough, hard drinking, and very knowledgeable, worldly. From my point of view, mm -hmm. uh, he had a regular guy, in many ways, and he used to love to box and things like that. And I remember down at the Steve house, he taught me quite a bit on how to how to box, you know. And he had long arms, and but from a hunting standpoint, I didn't like him because he was a killer. He mm -hmm. loved blood, and he'd kill and kill and kill and kill and kill. And kill. And it kind of sickened me, and uh, so about 39 or 40, I stayed out of college a year or so, and uh, I got, 1940, I got out of the guiding business, and uh, then I didn't ever see Ernie until after World War II, and I met him down in the old Christian yeah. shopping center. And so we visited. And he was a very changed person. He was uh, not the same person to me at all. He was quite mild. I think that airplane wreck had been something. Mm -hmm. he, was, uh, he was very mild mannered. And he had always been, he'd be keen at that point good friends with George Sagers, it had been hurting. Mm -hmm. And they did most of the travel with him and Lloyd Arnold. And I never did do much from that point on. I met him in a snug down in Haiti a time or two on our way home from various trips, but I'd be with somebody else. Yeah. But he was always very kind and warm with, the, with me. And I never knew him to give anybody a bad time, ever. Um, at the last, I remember I rented him a car, which he drove to Key West, a Hertz car. And he did that because he felt that he was being watched by somebody. I Somebody else and mentioned that he thought he, he was kind of paranoid or, or maybe was being watched. Well, well, I thought that he was paranoid. Because he told me, he said, this way they won't know where I am, and I can maybe get rid of them for a while. So he and Mary took this car, drove clear to Key West with it. Then later, uh, many years, well, matter of fact, only a couple of years later, I found out that they were hounding him. Well, who was? The FBI? Yeah. You think? And the reason was, according to this newspaper article, that Hemingway had. Uh, was well known in Cuba, and he frequently oh, yeah. sat in the bars and things, and he set up a spy thing for the CIA because there was a lot of, of Nazi Germany uh -huh. and all that stuff. Uh -huh. He was trying to get her information because Cuba was not involved in the war yeah. at that time. And uh, so uh, then they questioned his, uh, his background because he fought for the loyalists in Spain, so, yeah. and they were they were supported by the communists, and the, uh, the fascists supported General Decimo Franco. Yeah. So they were watching him um. all right, and so he was not paranoid, but it did bother him and haunted him, mm -hmm. and uh, probably had a great deal to do with his change in personality, mm -hmm. because he became quite secretive, you know. That's what I understand. He didn't go out much, and he was very careful who he talked to and things like that. But he was a robust old man. I knew his wife, Martha Gellhorn, too. Yeah. <laughs> she was quite a nice gal. Not 
she was not, a, I don't think, the homemaker that Mary was. Yeah, you know. she was more of a independent, a new woman, so to speak. Yeah, well, a new woman in the old days. In the old days, yeah. <laughs> Did you ever meet Ernest Hemingway? Oh yeah, I lived beside of him for two winters. Oh really? Oh yeah, I knew Ernest Hemingway real well. I knew his wife, and uh, I used lived. Uh, I used to see him almost every day. Uh, his uh, wife uh, told me a little bit about him. He said he got up at four o'clock every morning, and and he uh, go in his bedroom and write, mm -hmm. and he didn't want anybody to come in or bother him at all when he was writing and he'd write at noon and then he'd come out and have lunch and, and then they'd go down down on the desert and shoot rabbits uh, and uh, then they'd take him over to Silver Creek and string him up in the trees mm -hmm. up there uh, and then the next day they'd go down and the crows would be up there eating the, them rabbits and then they'd shoot the crows. Oh, huh, isn't that yeah. interesting? And I've been out to his house I was out there. He had more guns out there. See my, I had a few of my guns there. See them. Mm -hmm. I he 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 had one that would go from here clear to the end there, and I had lots of guns. And uh, 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 a Taylor used to go down to his place in Cuba and go on his boat and stay down there uh, and fish for a month or six weeks every spring mm -hmm. when the ski lift was out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I knew Ernest Hemingway, knew his wife, and uh, I talked to him almost every day mm -hmm. in, out there. To say know. hello. Well, what was what was your impression of him? Was he a? Uh, he was a very always very nice with me, and uh, 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 it was very nice. I I liked Hemingway very much. I never did read any of his books. You know, I'm not. I have a. I don't read very much. I. Got one eye I haven't been able to see out of since I was five years old, mm -hmm. and uh, that tires my eye. I don't want to read, right. and uh, I don't want television very much. Walk the stock market a little bit and watch a few programs, but uh, I uh, never did read any of his books. Uh, I know he, uh, I've heard a lot about of his books and and uh, on all, but I never read him. But I, I liked Hemingway very much. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the Hemingway years, uh, and the Hemingway spent part of the last two years of his life here, and of course... Did you meet him? Uh, or do you have an impression of him? Well, uh, yes, yeah, so I met him when he first came, because he came through with one of the, the bullfighters. Uh, George spent that summer with his wife, Pat, over in, in Spain uh, with the Hemingways, and then that fall, uh, late fall, the Hemingways came through with one of the bullfighters, Adanez, and who was on his way to, to Mexico to fight. That fall, uh, late fall, Mary fell and broke her elbow, and George and I uh, worked long and hard at, on a totally shattered elbow. Mary was hunting, and a duck went overhead. She shot it and fell and shattered her elbow, her left elbow. Hmm. And we worked, worked for hours on that, so I got to know. Hemingway fairly well at the at the time, although George was 
was very, very close to him. Mm-hmm. And uh, was there were there signs of his decline at that time to you? Well, I think we all knew about it. The the this was the following fall that the first became obvious. His friends who were very close to him really protected him so that most people were not aware of it. But the people who were very, very close to him, Chuck Atkinson, Don Anderson, uh, George Saviors, I think, saw this, although the they, uh, rest of us weren't aware of it until he did was hospitalized for the problem and then went on to the Mayo Clinic. This is all in his various biographies, right. so I think that there's, there's no, no secret about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, uh, was he hospitalized at Moritz for a time before yes, going? Yes, before going to Mayo Clinic, he was there. Uh, and I think George Saviors, of course, knows about this. George has never wanted to talk about it, and he's felt quite properly, I think, that this is, is privileged information. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's always come under a great deal of pressure from various people who wanted to write about Hemingway and has uh, uh, remained perfectly silent. I have to have the people at the Mayo Clinic about Hemingway's illness. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. In the 30s, he was he was hard working again. He was doing the Spanish piece then, and he was finishing that up. And the in, in the 50s, when I knew him, as I say, he was trying to get this uh, Garden of Eden together, which was pretty tough because it was a new a new kind of writing for people and for, for him too. And then the end, he was trying to get the, the movable feast together. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was tough because he wasn't well. He was, his depressions were getting more serious. Mm-hmm. Were you in, knew it. Were you involved in the decision for him to go to the Mayo Clinic? Oh yeah, uh, John and I, uh, we really, Mr. Hemingway was a, a dear friend and, uh, of mine and, and one of the most intelligent men I ever met, but you didn't tell Mr. Hemingway, this is the way it's going to be, we're going to go to the mayor. He knew that I knew that he knew what his basic problem was, which was his depressions mm-hmm. that he had had since he was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, he just couldn't face up to the fact that uh, maybe he needed treatment for this. And then uh, John and I thought that psychiatry He was finally getting treatment maybe 40 years late. Mm. Mm-hmm. What about treatment during those days? Was it the, the kind of treatment that he needed? Oh, what do you mean? Well, um, as far as, uh, did, it, was it, and did it end up hurting him more, or was it a help as far as shock? Yeah, that's very, very, very difficult to, for me to answer. I, I think even today, electric shock therapy for certain types of depressions is a legitimate and a good form of treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are now many 
excellent drugs out now to mm-hmm. treat depressions uh, that uh, weren't available in, in, the, in the 50s. Mm-hmm. When he came back here from the Mayo Clinic, how was he? Because uh, he was only a, it was only a few days, wasn't that correct? Well, see, he he went there twice. twice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he had thought about suicide all his life. Mm-hmm. His dad committed suicide because of both physical and emotional illnesses. Uh, his brother committed suicide. His sister committed suicide. Uh, he talked of suicide even when he was a kid. I think that uh, uh, when he finally had so much difficulty in writing, like in the old days when he was young, he would turn out these short stories, and, you know, literally a few weeks. Mm-hmm. even rewriting them and so on, and uh, I used to talk with him about other people and other professors retire, executives retire, mm-hmm. and uh, he, did, he, he just paid no attention to me. And he, when he couldn't when he couldn't write, that was, uh, he just didn't have, have, but see, he had, in the 40s, he, he didn't do much. Early 50s, Old Man in the Sea, he got that together, but that is, as I understand, had, had, he had written some of that before, and at the end, he was trying to get, uh, uh, the Garden of Eden together, but couldn't, so it is what he wrote in my book. George, this was as good as I could do then, or maybe always. He, this was referring to how he wrote when he was 20 years old. Um, well, by the time the 50s, early 60s came, he was probably very frustrated then. Right? Oh, or, extremely so. Yeah. And that, that, I think that, uh, Probably uh, with his long-term history of depressions and so forth, that just uh, made it made it much worse. Mm-hmm. Did you get to know Hemingway at the time that he was here? Yes. I knew him best the summer after the war was over. Uh, I came up here that summer before Sun Valley reopened. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Hemingway was here and writing one of his books at that time. I don't recall which one it was, Mm -hmm. but uh, anyway, he had uh, come over from, from Cuba and was spending the summer and fall here. And uh, there are not very many people back here. Pappy Arnold, for instance, was not back at that time. There was no friend of Mr. Hemingway. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and um, <coughs> um, Mr. Hemingway had had a blood pressure problem that uh, required frequent checks or as he thought he needed them. Mm-hmm. And so, I saw him oh, several times a week, and uh, it was largely just a matter of uh, visiting, mm-hmm. and, or rather my listening. Yes. What did he talk about? Oh, everything. Mm-hmm. His experiences in the war, his experiences in Cuba, family. Mm-hmm. He was a, to 
tremendously interesting man, of course, as you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so articulate. Did you get a feel for how he felt about here? I, about, my impressions were so different than the uh, written uh, biographical sketches that have come out in books since he died. I thought he was a very gentle, very sensitive man, very, very caring about his family, mm -hmm. intensely interested in what his boys were doing, although they probably never knew that he was. Mm -hmm. that he was. Were I you, liked him very much. Yes. Um, did you come in contact with him in his later years here? That's with worse than eight years. <clears throat> oh, in the, the well, well not thinking in the in 1960. Well, I used to. Of course, he was after he built his house here. Mm -hmm. I saw him just uh, socially uh, frequently, but uh, uh, I think most of his medical ex uh, contacts were with Dr. Saviors. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of his decline at the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. I was aware of it in this way that uh, he was disappointed that he couldn't do, couldn't produce, mm -hmm. as he, and he, he mentioned as he, his expression was, he, the juices don't flow anymore. Mm -hmm. Well. He had quite a bit. Well, then he went to the Mayo Clinic, too, and... Uh, uh, Dr. Sabres took him to the Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. uh, uh, during, a, during his final months. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think it's helped very much. Right. Well, I, I was able to interview Dr. Earl, and he was saying that... Uh, there was some discussion over whether or not the Mayo Clinic should have let him come back. Uh, in either place, he would have been in the same shape he was mm -hmm. in. I don't think the Mayo Clinic was ever uh, noted for uh, psychiatric right. treatment. It's not primarily a psychiatric place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what the what the facts are, I, I know that uh, an effort was made at that time to uh, get Mr. Hemingway to the uh, manager clinic in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't, as I say, I don't know what, uh, what happened to that effort, but it didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I doubt very much that anything could have done to alter the course of events. Mm -hmm. Do you recall the day that he died? Was he brought to the hospital? No, I, I do recall it. I was on duty that night on call, mm -hmm. and uh, I got a call about midnight that uh, <clears throat> my son, who was coming back from, he was, my son was in the uh, uh, service in uh, mm -hmm. Fort Ord. And had decided to ride his motorcycle back to uh, for his leave, leave of absence for his leave. And uh, south of uh, Bellevue, he had uh, it was dark, and uh, a fawn jumped out of the oh, no. uh, the bar pit, and uh, uh, he was knocked out and was unconscious. And picked up from the pavement by a fisherman or a hunter, I guess it was, coming up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was called and I went down to Haley to get him in the hospital there and bring him home. And uh, while I was down doing that, uh, Mr. Hemingway shot himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Earl, uh, when they couldn't get a hold of me, they got a hold of Scott Earl and he went over to the house mm -hmm. and uh, at Mrs. Hemingway's request. So I didn't know anything about it uh, 
be otherwise occupied until mm -hmm. the next morning. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the date that that, that, that happened, <coughs> except I remember the incident. Mm -hmm.